Hello? Check, check, mic, check. Can you guys hear me all right? Everything good? Excellent. Uh, again, I have been given the privilege and the honor to give us here today, uh, Among New Hope's English Ministry, the Word of God. Uh, thank you to the leadership team for being open and willing to give uh, young aspiring pastors a chance to serve in this capacity. Uh, I tell you guys, to be honest, it, it never really gets easier. Like, I, I'm sitting there during worship and my hands are trembling and I'm nervous and I'm nervous. And every time I sit back and I think to myself, like, I'm so old now. I remember when I was that young 18 year old in those preaching classes at Tacoa and I was nervous and I was scared. Like, Am I going to do a good job? Am I going to preach long enough? That's been one of my insecurities of my life is, am I hitting a certain time benchmark when I preach? But I'm always, I always found myself so nervous, so excited. And I, I praise God that over the years, it went from nervousness of, can I actually do this, to eager anticipation for what the Lord is going to do through me, how he's going to speak through me. Guys, today... As, as per usual, I'm going to be posing us a question as Mong New Hope's English ministry, a question that I want us to, to be thinking about as we go into the Word of God. Today, the question is, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? When you wake up in the morning, when you, when you speak to your parents, when you speak to your loved ones, when you speak to your coworkers, when you, when you, when you sleep at night, when you, when you rise in the morning, any and everything you do, why do you do what you do? What motivates you? What inspires you? What causes you to act? That's the question for us today, to be, to be having in the back of our minds, what do you, or why do you do what you do? What causes you to do the things you do? If you guys have the word of God, open with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. A little bit of context here. We're going to be uh, in verse 1 through verse 11 today. But a little bit of context about the book of Romans. The book of Romans is split into two major parts. The first half, it, it go, Paul is writing to the Roman church about orthodoxy, right doctrine, right, right theology. The second half is about right living, orthopraxy. Okay, today is chapter 8. It's towards the tail end of right doctrine. And he really hammers this point home for us before we actually get into the practicality part of how to live a sanctified life. To Christ. Okay, this is kind of his, his exclamation point to right doctrine. Okay. The word of God says this in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of the life of Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh... And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh are set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. But those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However you, however you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life in your mortal bodies through his spirit whom dwells in you. Church, let's pray really quick. Father God, I just thank you for this body of believers, whether in person or online, Lord. And I pray that at this moment you would humble me, God, and you would speak through me, Lord, to pierce the hearts of the people you have willed to be here today, God. Your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord, so we pray that we would rely on your word alone to do what it does, God. 
We trust in the, in the assurance of the word, Lord, that it accomplishes whatever it is you seek for it to accomplish, God. Allow me to just be a mouthpiece, just a person up here speaking these words, God. Speak through me. Open up the hearts and the minds of the people who would listen to your truth, God. And we pray a blessing over this time, and we thank you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. So to kind of help you guys kind of track with me as I, I tackle the question, why do you do what you do? Uh, we are going to break up this passage into three parts. Verse 1 through 4 is, is going to be a section within itself. Verse four or verse five through eight is going to be a section within itself, and verse nine through eleven is going to be a section within itself. But again, going back to the question I posed at the beginning, why do you do what you do? What does modern culture, what does American culture tell us the purpose of our life is? Prosperity, wealth, fame, security. These are all things that our culture tells us. These are the things that are important in our lives. These are the things that we need to hone in on. These are, the, these are the reasons why we wake up and go to work. We go to work because we need jobs for financial security. Do we not? So the culture is telling us, especially American culture, it gives us this consumerism idea of, oh, we have to go and we have to work and we have to make that American dream our own. But now the world is kind of embraced into this now postmodern culture, this idea, this belief that with the relativity, relativity of truth, it comes back to the self. It comes back to the self. Why do we do what we do? Well, I need to make a living. I need to provide for my family. I want this fame. I want this security. I, 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 this postmodern culture ingrains in our minds, it's about you. Why do you do what you do? Ultimately, it's about you. It's because I care about myself more than the person next to me. Let's be honest with ourselves, church. This is what our culture is telling us. This is why you get up in the morning. It's about you. But what does the word of God tell us? Why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? An interesting dichotomy that comes up in Romans chapter 8 here in the beginning is the flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit. Ultimately, it is our fleshly, sinful desires for ourselves or the God-glorifying, spirit-led desires for a life that glorifies him. As believers, this is, this is the duality that we see in the world. And maybe this is the duality that we see within ourselves. The flesh and the spirit. Paul tackles this in these 11 verses very beautifully. Let's, let's dive right into it. Verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Pause. Remember, guys. Remember. Apart from Christ, apart from Christ, we are all under the judgment, the wrath of God, and it is completely justice, justified. Sorry, It's completely warranted. We deserve God's wrath, okay? We deserve God's wrath because of sin and because of our sins. Because of sin, because of our sin nature, because of us being descendants of Adam, we deserve God's wrath. Okay. Let, let, let me just read for us in Romans chapter 3. You guys don't have to turn there. Just, just listen to what, to what Paul says here. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift as shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul here is talking about mankind here. Guys, we are children of wrath. We deserve nothing but God's wrath. We deserve nothing but God's wrath. But what does the passage say? What does the passage say? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For, for those who are in Christ, we no longer incur the righteous, just wrath of God. I mean, there's, there's a lie being told in our media today 
that only a certain amount of people go to hell. Only a certain kind of people go to hell. And I know hell is something that we don't like to talk about in the church, but ladies and gentlemen, we need to talk about hell in the church. The reality is there are people in the world that believe hell is only for Saddam Hussein, Hitler, the murderers out there, the rapists out there, the child molesters out there, the thieves out there. Hell's for them. I don't do that stuff, so I'm good. Like, I, I, I don't deserve hell. That is something that we believe in the modern church today. We believe that we are some, somehow different from these other people. But in reality, we deserve that same kind of wrath and judgment, the same kind of punishment, unless we are in Christ. Unless we are in Christ. Because in Christ, there is now no condemnation. Why is this? Why is this? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. Here, it's not talking about the Mosaic law. We'll get to that, the Mosaic law. But here, Paul is referring to law in terms of authority, obedience, having something owed to. The reality is, in Christ, we are under the law of life. We are given life. We, 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 are, we are brought to life with Christ in the spirit. However, apart from Christ, there is only death. Sin and death. Here it says the law of sin and death. So with that framework in mind about the word law with a, with a lowercase l, we have to realize that previously we were bound to sin. We had bondage to sin. Okay, we were slaves to sin. But now we have bondage and are slaves to Christ. Now some of you may be thinking, why, why would I want to be a slave to Christ? Ladies and gentlemen, that's a glorious thing that we can say with full assurance, I'm a slave for the cause of Christ. I'm a slave for the cause of Christ. I'm a slave for the gospel. That is a beautiful thing we get to say. The only other option is I am a slave to my fleshly, sinful, God-dishonoring desires, and I love it. Those are our options, church. The reality is we are now bound to Christ. We are slaves to Christ. We are no longer slaves to death and to sin. In Christ, there is no condemnation. There is no being bound to sin. Verse 3, Paul says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, you guys... You guys know that the law, the Mosaic law, is something that the Jewish people, they, they held that and they grasped onto that and they're like, we are not letting this go. This is our truth. This is our measure of how we can be righteous. Remember the Pharisees, the dudes that Jesus kind of went in and did work on them? He corrected them. He rebuked them. He exhorted them. The Pharisees, they literally grabbed the law of Moses and they, they acted like it was a, like a list, like a, a shopping list. They checked off, oh, yep, I did that, I did that, I did that, I did that. They checked it all off and what they were saying was when they looked at it, they are like, I have achieved righteousness because I have kept the law. That was never the purpose of the law, guys. The law, the Mosaic law, was an instrument to reveal sinfulness. It wasn't a way to earn righteousness. It was a way for us to look at it and see it and read it and be like, I can't be any of this. I can't do any of this. I need the Lord to save me. I need to place my faith in him. I love, I, I love this, this little, I guess, uh, what's it? I guess an interjection that Jesus has in Matthew chapter 5. If you guys could turn with me there, actually, I want you guys to turn with me. Uh, we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount for a little bit here. This is a beautiful, I guess, truth that Jesus gives to the people on the Sermon of the Mount. Again, he's speaking directly to Jews, modern day, or mo not modern day Jews, but modern day Jews in his day, okay? Again, the ones that held on to the law, okay? The ones that held on to the law. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to be jumping around, but we're going to start in verse 21. Verse 21 says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. 
But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you are good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. Again, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust in, lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 31, sorry. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Again, there's a lot of different interactions Jesus has in, uh, in Matthew chapter 5 here. But the idea of what he's doing is he's taking their law and he's... He's essentially saying, you guys think you guys have reached this level of righteousness? Let me, let me take this a, another step higher. Let me, let me raise that bar just so you guys can realize that it was never meant to be a benchmark for righteousness. But the law was meant to reveal sin, which brings you to faith in God. That was the purpose of the law. Yet, what do we know what happened? The Jews, the, the, the Pharisees, they went and they made it a list. Uh, uh, a, a benchmark of righteousness. But what does the word of God say here in Romans chapter 8? For the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. God did. So again, the idea was to reveal sin, ultimately to produce faith, ultimately to be seen as righteous before God. But what does God do? Because the law could not do. He sends Christ down. Christ becomes a man. He's, he's born and he grows and he lives a sinless life. In his passive obedience and, his, and, in, and in, in his active obedience on the cross, Christ becomes righteousness. He becomes the righteousness that we need to no longer be under the condemnation of God. Christ becomes that righteousness. And it's in Christ that we share that righteousness. It's in placing our faith in Christ that we have his righteousness, so that we are no longer under the condemnation of God's righteous wrath. Okay, again, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. There's this interchange that goes on. Okay, there's this interchange of Christ fulfilling the, the law, Christ being the one who is righteousness. And when we place our faith in Christ, we are given his righteousness and our sinfulness is placed on him on the cross. Church, these first four, these first four passage, or verses in this passage, we have a new life in the spirit. Through Christ's redeeming work on the cross, we have new life. Why do we do what we do? We do what we do because we have new life. We live according to the spirit. We live according to God's law, his righteousness, according to Christ's righteousness. This is why we do what we do. But here in verse 4, Paul begins to juggle the flesh and the, the spirit, the life and the death dichotomy. Here in verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. First things first, church. We need to understand with verse 5 here that it's our mindset that things flow from. Our disposition leads into our mindset, which leads into our lifestyle. If our disposition is we are still under sin, we are still under the flesh, then that leads into our lifestyle of how we conduct ourselves, and that leads into our conduct of what we do and why we do it. But church, 
remember, we are identified in Christ. We live according to the Spirit of God, who is life. We live out the gospel, church. There's this duality here in verse 6 that Paul brings up about spiritual life and deadness. And there, there, there's this truth that we are spiritually dead. But in, in Christ, we, we are made alive. But also, there's this reality of death. Of death. Death is one of the things that we incurred in the fall. Physical death is still a reality. That's why he condemned sin in the flesh. That's why even though, oops, sorry. That's why even though we place our faith in Christ and are given life, our physical bodies are still deteriorating. We still die. And that is why we still struggle with our sin, even though we have been placed under the Spirit. Even though we've been filled with the Spirit, even though we live according to the Word of God, we still struggle with our flesh, with our sin. But what does verse 7 say here? The mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. We need to realize that there's a war being waged within each of us every single day. Sure, behind a pulpit and in front of you guys, I could tell you guys, it's easy to, to live in the spirit. But I know that's a lie. And you guys know that's a lie. This, this battle being waged, it's something that we need to actively partake in. We need to grasp and understand where we are, who we are serving, who we follow. But it's also good to understand where we were. Remember, we were, we were dead. We were deserving of God's wrath, yet he liberates us from it. And now we live in the spirit. Now we live in the spirit. For again, the person who is in the flesh is hostile to God. They're hostile to God. They can't even begin to submit to the Lord. There's, there's this reality that the desires of the world are, are contrary to the desires of God. Let me read for us really quickly uh, a verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Foolishness. This world looks at the gospel. This world looks at the church. This world looks at Christ and sees it as foolishness. Indeed, there is enmity between the world and God. But again, we have been liberated from sin. We, we have been given newness of life. We are with the spirit. We are with God. Yet we still wrestle with our flesh, with our sin. Verse 8, really quickly here. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Here's another lie that we are told by our, by our culture. Just do enough good. Just be a good enough person. Just donate to the to the don like the Salvation Army, to the Red Cross. Give your stuff away. Be be a humanitarian. Just just if you do that, if you do enough good, as opposed to doing enough bad, you'll be all right. That's what our that's what our culture is telling us. We have to do good, but we know that righteousness righteousness is not earned by our actions. We also know that doing good, it's a byproduct of our faith. It's not the reason for our faith, church. Nothing we do apart from faith in God can please him. This also includes worship. You can worship God, but if you do not worship God with true faithfulness and understanding what he has done for you on the cross, that is not pleasing. That's something that we need to hear in the church today. Worship isn't just Christy and C coming up here to sing for us, even though they did an awesome job. Worship is us realizing our need for a savior, even having been saved. Worship is us placing that faith that he gave us into him and, and realizing who he is and admonishing who he is and worshiping who he is. Worship isn't song time. Worship isn't listen to a story time. 
Worship is recognizing who God is and praising him for it. Recognizing who God is and praising him for it. Again, in these quick little four verses for uh, verse five through eight, there's this, this argument Paul is bringing about, about flesh and spirit. Spirit and death, life and death. We know which side we're on because of what Christ has done. Yet we know that we still wrestle with these things. So why do you do what you do? You do what you do because the Spirit compels you to do it. We wrestle well. You wrestle well with your sin. You wrestle well with your sin. Knowing where you've been and knowing where Christ has brought you but still wrestling with it. So that leads us to this, to this point where it's like, okay, well, if I'm still wrestling with my sin, but I've been saved, where, where's the hope in that? Where, where, where is the hope in that? Read with me in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. For, or excuse me, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you your mortal bodies, or give you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, we belong to Christ. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 tells us we are sealed by the Spirit. We are identified by being in Christ, by having the Spirit. Okay? We have the Spirit. It is indwelt within us. Yeah. Because of the Spirit, we are able to see and we are able to understand that there is a conflict between sin and spirit, flesh and spirit. Again, for you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, which it does, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Again, there's this, this battle within us about sin and flesh, or excuse me, flesh and spirit. However, what does verse 11 say? But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give to your mortal body, give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is our assurance. This is our hope for the future. That even when our mortal bodies pass away, even when we depart from this earth, that we have been given newness of life. We have been given eternal life through belonging to Christ by being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Again, this is why we do what we do. Ultimately, it's one, because we understand that we have newness and life in the Spirit. We do what we do because we understand that there is a struggle between sin and spirit, flesh and spirit. And thirdly, we do what we do because we have assurance of the hope that being in the spirit gives us. That even when we pass away, even, in, even when we depart from this world, we will be with Christ. We will be raised again with Christ. That is why we do what we do, church. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you for uh, this time that you have allotted for us to be in your word, God. We thank you for, for what you've done on the cross, God. We thank you for the salvation that you provided for us. We thank you for the faith that you imbued within us, God. We thank you for all the things that you have blessed us with, God. And Lord, we also thank you that you saved us. Let us not remember, or excuse me, let's not forget, God, that you didn't have to save us, Lord. You didn't have to save us. Yet you sent Christ down, and he died on the cross for all of us, that it would place our faith in him. And we thank you for your gospel, God, and we just pray that every moment we have, every interaction we have, every moment we wake up when we rise in the morning, God, we would ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? And we would pray that it would be the gospel 
this is why we do what we do. Because we've been given new life, Lord. We've been freed from slave, from sin, God. And we just pray that we would obediently follow your word. We would be humble as Christ is humble. We would love as Christ is loved, God. So this is our prayer, Lord, that when we ask the question, why do we do what we do? We can say with assurance, we do what we do for the gospel. We thank you and we praise you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, you guys are free to go. I think we don't have anything else. All right. Um, see you guys next week. Next week, again, as Super Matt said, it is Christmas service. We're not doing combined, so just show up by 1145 and things will go as per usual.